In our last episode, we were taking a look at using the dsquery and dsget tool to get interesting information about users and groups within the domain. But in this episode, we'd like to take a look at how we can take some of that information and turn it into a real usable audit task or security task within your domain. Now, just as a reminder, the things that we're doing here do not require administrative credentials. Though, in my particular case, I am logged in as the administrator, simply because I'm working within a test domain. However, any authenticated user within your domain who installs the admin pack tools will be able to run these queries. Now, let's just get started here, and we're going to go through some of it kind of fast. I'd like to bring up a command interpreter, and I'm just going to go on to my desktop here because I've got a, uh, a file here that we're going to take a look at in a few minutes. It's a list of all of the employees in our organization, and we've gotten this from our human resources department. What we're going to try to do is see if we can map the employees in our company to actual user accounts that exist and see if there are differences. Very, very important task to do. So, Last time, we were talking about using dsquery and the fact that we can use dsquery user to get back information about all of the users in our domain. And we also, of course, have talked about the need to add the limit option, particularly limit zero, so that we can get just those accounts for, uh, or actually all of the accounts within the domain and not miss any inadvertently. One of the other very important options that we have with dsquery, though, allows us to extract out the user ID. Now, in some domains, you'll find that the user account objects are actually populated with real first name, last name information. But that is not always the case. The reason I point that out is that if we look at the help file for dsquery user, let me just put that through more so we can see it, you'll see that down in the list here, we do have some options here to find names, but also to get information about first names and last names. Now, the way that this would actually happen is that after we use the DS query, we can run that through DS get and pull out individual aspects of that user account name. So, for instance, here, if I were to run DS query user, ask it to get all of the accounts and then send those fully distinguished names through dsgetuser and to show me the first name and the last name, what I should see would be all of the first and last names of my users. You'll note in my case though, I was not successful. I got a whole bunch of empty results. And the reason is that some administrators do not properly populate these fields. And this can make doing this uh, user audit very difficult. However, there is another strategy we can take. We could use the SAM ID. Now, the SAM ID is going to look very familiar to you because the SAM ID turns out to be the logon ID. It's what you type when you want to log in as a user. And if we scroll up in this list, you'll see up here familiar accounts like the uh, Kerberos ticket granting ticket administration account, the administrator account, and here's my account. So these are pretty familiar names. These are the SAM IDs. Now, in the other list that we pulled out, none of that information showed up because none of the first and last name information is populated. Well, what can we do with this? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this information and I'm going to run it through the sort command so that it's going to be in alphabetical order. Now, as it sorts this, of course it's going to sort what it sees and we can end up with some gaps in here because notice that uh, Paul Whitehead, well, that's his SAM ID. It's not going to be sorted by Whitehead. It'll be sorted by the P for Paul. But that's okay. It'll work out just fine for what we're doing. And I'm going to store that into a file called, how about SAM IDs? Now, once that's completed, I'm actually going to open that file up inside of an editor. So let me just open that up and it'll prompt me for what to use. Notepad is just fine, and I can see that it's put all of the accounts in here. Now, you'll find that it has also appended the DS get successful line, which we don't need. So we're going to chop that line out, and there's something else that it's done. You'll notice that there's actually some white space in here at the beginning of lines and at the end of lines. 
Now that white space, I don't really want it there. And it's really going to mess me up when I try to do the comparison against the actual employees. Because any differences in the line will show up. But there's a really easy way to solve this problem. We can just use a search and replace. So I'm going to tell it to search for spaces and replace them with nothing and do a replace all. Now all of that white space at the end of the lines are gone and so is the white space at the beginning of the line. So I can save that file back out and close it up. Now before I go on I just want to point out that the task I just performed extracting out the white space, those sorts of things, can absolutely be automated using the technique that we're now going to examine. Now what's that? Well, let's go back to that employee list for just a moment. At this point, I have a list of all of the account names in the domain, and I have a list of all of the employees. In this particular case, the employees are in this comma separated values file, and it happens to have the first name, no, excuse me, the last name followed by the first name. It could very well be that the information available from the address book or from the human resources department has a lot of other information in here too, but that really doesn't matter because we can very easily pull this information apart and turn it into something that's easy to compare to the SAM IDs that I have. Let's see how we do that. Now to experiment with that, we're going to take a look at how to create a PowerShell script. Before we really get into that though, let me just start up PowerShell here and that's going to get me into this, uh, into, into PowerShell itself. And I want to take a look at the, uh, the, let's see, set execution policy. And it's currently going to let me pick what that policy will be. Now the execution policy I can't recall how to get it here. Oh, there it is, get execution policy. I currently have set to remote signed. Remote signed is actually what we want to use in this case. The default setting will require that all of your scripts are signed. And while this is very secure, it can be very inconvenient when you're writing local scripts because it would require you to take the extra step well, actually several extra steps of setting up a certificate authority, having a signed certificate, and then using that signing certificate to sign all of your scripts before they will ever run. That's really good in a domain because it limits which scripts can actually be run by anyone in the domain. But for what we're trying to do right here, I'd really like to be able to work with my script and not go through that extra effort. So the recommended setting for us here is going to be remote signed. And the way you make that happen is that after starting up PowerShell, which is available by default in Windows Vista and higher, including Windows Server 2008, and available as an add-on for older versions of Windows, you simply get yourself into PowerShell, which we did right up here. You could see what your policy is with get execution policy, and then you could set your execution policy, and you could just type it right here, remote signed and it's all set. We can double check it. There it is. Now that I've got it set to remote signed, I can write scripts here on this machine and then have them execute without having to sign them. Now you could write your script or, or manipulate the data right here at the command line, but it's far more interesting to turn it into a script that you can run in the future. Now to do that, we can start up the, uh, let's just start with Notepad, and we'll take a look at another option in a few minutes. Let's start up Notepad, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to call this, let's say, uh, getusers.ps1. Now the .ps1 extension, that's the default extension that's recognized for PowerShell scripts. So that's the one we'd prefer to use. And while PowerShell can be a really complex language, for what we're doing here, it's actually not that hard and we could think of what we're doing now in terms of creating a recipe that you could easily replicate in order to do other sorts of tests. So let me just write the script and talk you through it as we write it, see what the results are of it, and, and then talk about how it could be modified. One of the things that PowerShell allows you to do is to loop through sets of content. And the command that allows us to do this is a built-in command called foreach. It allows you to take a list and work with each element one at a time. 
Now to use this, we have to give it a variable name to use to keep track of which element we're on right now. And I'm going to call that EMP for employee. And I've prefixed this with a dollar sign. Now the dollar sign here literally is representing a scalar value, but you don't need to complicate things with that. You could think, simply think of this as the way that you need to refer to variables. So we say there's going to be an employee, and for this particular employee, well, where is he coming from? Well, here's where he comings, comes from. In this list, for each employee in, now the content that we have is this employee's CSV file. So how do I access that? Well, built into PowerShell are some commandlets. Actually, when we write a, a script in PowerShell, what we're really creating is a commandlet. This pre-existing commandlet allows us to read in content, in this case from a file. I'm going to tell it to read it from employees.csv. Now, of course, there are techniques we can use to have it pop open a window and allow us to select which file to use, but we're trying to keep this script as simple as possible. So, now that I've got that written in there, let me close up those parentheses. Now I've got it ready to loop through the contents of that file. I need to tell it what to do with that employee. So let me create some curly braces here, which are pretty typical to find in scripting languages to set off blocks of code. For each employee that's found in the file, it's going to run this code. The code I'd like it to run is to take the names, now I'm just creating a new variable here, and I'm going to populate that from the array that's created if we take the employee that we currently have and split what's on that line wherever there are commas found. So in other words, we're taking this, this uh, text string and splitting it based on those comma separated values. Perfect. Since we have last name or yeah, last name comma first name, that means that the first value in the array will be the last name. The second will be the first name. Wonderful. Now I'm going to set last name equal to whatever value is in that array at the zero position, the very first element. And I'm going to set the, well, let's start with first name, but we may come back and change that. I'm going to set the first name to be whatever's found at names in position one. Then I can simply echo first name last name. Now notice that I didn't put any spaces there because if we go back and look at our SAM IDs, pull that back up in notepad here, you'll see that there are no spaces between them. We have Kathy Pavlok and that's it. There's no space at all. And the usernames here in this organization are a little unusual. Usually we find usernames are something like first initial last name. And in this case they're using full name. We'll come back to that and see how to change our script to address that. Now that that's done, we're actually done with our script. So let me save that out and exit out of here. And since I'm still running in PowerShell, let's see what happens if I actually try to run get users. Well, there it is. What get users has just done is gone through and pulled out the names from the employee CSV file. And it's simply taken the first name and mashed it up with the last name. Now we could also turn that into a sorted list just like we did with our DS query and DS get. There we go. So we can have it line up with exactly what we'd find in that SAM IDs file. And at this point, we could take a look at maybe using a tool like CSDIF or even file compare that we looked at in previous episodes. But let's just do that very quickly. And I don't expect to see a lot of really good results here, but let's see what we have. So I'm going to sort that into, um, let's see, let's call this, uh, uh, where did this come from? Let's call this HR user IDs. And then let's run file compare HR user IDs to SAM IDs. Now, notice that I've now gotten an error here. Positional parameter cannot be found. Well, apparently the FC has some meaning for PowerShell. So let me drop out of that and try this again. Let's run the file compare HR user IDs against SAM IDs. And there we go. It's now going to try to show me differences. Now, the differences we're looking at here do look a little bit hard to read here. It's kind of, kind of 
pulling apart here, and this is one of the reasons I don't like to use File Compare. Notice it says uh, rsync failed, files are too different. The right tool to use for this would be diff or csdiff, which will show you what's really changing in a much more intelligent way. Now, why would there be differences? Well, because you are going to definitely have accounts for people that don't exist as employees. Service accounts, things of that sort. So, we expect to see those things. And the first time you do this, you would have a large number or a fair number of differences. But after it's done one time, we can maintain a list of those additional accounts too, making this a really easy task to run. I'd like to just touch on a few more issues to round out this episode, because there's a few lingering things. The first one is, now that I'm not in the PowerShell at command prompt, if I try to run get users, notice that it opens up an editor instead of running the script. This is actually the default behavior. If you'd like it to actually run the command commandlet, you could do this. So we tell it this PS1 is a PowerShell commandlet. Please interpret it. The reason that's necessary is that PowerShell is not actually the native language of the command prompt. Instead, batch scripts are. Now, we could change our, our script interpreter and change this behavior, but we're not going to get into that in this particular episode. Another thing we'd like to take a look at is an alternative editor. You may notice on my desktop that the icon has changed for get users, and it now has this little PowerShell command prompt at it. In fact, if I right-click and choose to edit that, notice that it no longer opens it in, in, power, in a notepad, but it's now opening it in a built-in PowerShell editor that even does syntax highlighting. So you can get immediate feedback if you're doing something wrong. Once now that we're in here, I'd just like to make a little adjustment to this because you may be listening to the episode and saying, this sounds good, but you know, my usernames don't look like that. We use first initial last name. What can I do? Well, here's the answer. Let's modify the script just a little bit. I'm going to change this to first initial. Now that doesn't magically do anything. It's still being assigned whatever that first name is, but there's a there are some additional things we can do in PowerShell. Since that name string is being viewed as a string object, we can actually run commands or run additional member functions right against that string right here. So I can just add a dot substring and tell it to start at the zero offset, the beginning of the string, and take the first character, and then print out that character. Well, let's see what this does to our script. If I save this, and if I now play it right here in the interpreter, and this is one of the nice things about using this editor, you can see your output right here in the middle. Notice that it's now showing us first initial, last name. And of course there's even more I could do with this, perhaps modifying the case or doing whatever else I need to to get this data into just the condition it needs to be in order to perform my audit. Well, that's where we're going to stop for today. Look forward in future episodes. We'll be looking at more details of PowerShell and other kinds of tests that we can run. And in our next episode, we'll also take a look at a really interesting feature that's available in Windows operating systems, a sort of Easter egg that gives you easy access to the different administration control panels.